here. Uh, you'll notice that I'm socially distancing myself from all of you. But um, as for you, you're all fucked. Um, I normally wear a bandana, and, and this is my special um, don't tread on me bandana. But I was told that I was not allowed to wear it in here out of respect for the servicemen. But I think it's far more respectful to show a sign of, of what they died for than it is for the pokers that raises the revenue up here, which I'm sure they turn in their graves for. Uh, regardless, what I'd like to talk to you about is something completely different, which is uh, digital liberty, yeah? So, uh, uh, as you all know, I mean, we, we have certain freedoms that we take for granted in the modern world, you know, things like freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of religion. But uh, technology has advanced a lot, uh, a lot since uh, we sort of came up with these conceptions. And the question is, how do we uh, maintain these liberties in a world where government and not just government, but all sorts of adversarial people that we have faith in, or are supposed to have faith in, uh, have the ability to intercept everything that we see and know everything about us and manipulate it to their advantage against ourselves? And does this require some kind of updating of what our conception of freedom means in this modern era where the technology has changed completely? So we'll start with something that we're all very, very familiar with, and that is targeted advertising. So this is just a simple graph I picked up on Google the other day showing some of the, um, the cost per clicks of, uh, of, of placed advertisements on platforms like Facebook and that kind of thing. And you can see, you know, business services, $58 for a single click. That is, that's how much the person who does the placed advertisement pays the advertiser when someone clicks that button, okay? Now, the highest of all of them um, is the keyword lawsuit mesothemia. Mesothemia is, is the lung cancer you get from asbestos exposure. Okay, uh, so six hundred and fifteen dollars when someone clicks that advertisement. So if you're going to be placing these advertisements all around the place on the internet, and every time someone clicks it, they're paying the business that's sponsoring it is paying that amount of money. There needs to be a pretty high damn confidence that they're targeting it correctly. Now something like mesothemia lawsuit is not something that you're going to be openly advertising on Facebook. That's highly confidential. This is not something that people openly talk about. Nonetheless, they're able to infer it about you with such accuracy that they have sufficient confidence that they're able to charge that amount of money uh, for clicking that single button. Uh, and that's just from observing patterns of behavior that may not involve any of those direct keywords. It's inferred from other means. And that's how all of the placed advertising works. They observe your pattern of behavior and use that to correlate with things that might be of direct interest to you. If you're a woman of a certain age, they give you, my, my partner Wendy, she you know, gets uh, you know, fertilization treatment advertisements, for example, you know, because they know that that's that demographic and that's what you should tie into. And then they realize that we've booked a holiday to, to go climbing together. All of a sudden, she gets advertisements uh, for, for climbing equipment. So how does that sort of uh, technique work? Well, um, it's all based these days on, you know, as you probably know, machine learning. One of the elements of machine learning is uh, just simple statistical analysis. So here are some simple examples where you've got two different parameters showing some, some different points in the distribution where there's no correlation or a perfect correlation or some correlation. Virtually everything fits into the category of some correlation. Right? You can roughly correlate someone's IQ with their earnings, for example. There's a pretty good correspondence there. So, for example, if you know, if you, if you know that someone has this earning, then with that level of confidence, you know sort of what their, what their IQ is, depending on how spread out that distribution is. Now, lots of these variances, these, these profiles are very big. You can't pinpoint it with one data point. But you take a whole bunch of these plots with different parameters and you combine them together and you can very, very tightly narrow down exactly what someone's profile is. So the Cambridge Analytica that you all know about, the, the huge controversy about that, um, they obtained access to the, to the Facebook um, user profile database and uh, were advertising that they had something on the order of 6,000 data points for every person that they had in their data, database. So, now, if you imagine that you've got a very tight correlation, then with one data point, you can infer something else with an enormous degree of accuracy. With 6,000 data points about any one of you in the room, 
I can infer virtually anything, anything at all, whether you overtly say it or not. And that can be weaponized, and that's exactly what was done with Cambridge Analytica. Now, we all know that that had, whether or not it did tip the election, it certainly had the potential to. And it was certainly targeted with that intent. And that is that you did targeted advertising at individual users uh, according to their individual data points, what's most likely to psychologically manipulate them. Okay, now this is a small office in, a, in an office building uh, somewhere in the UK. Imagine what the government could do with this, uh, given that they have far more data points on you than Cambridge Analytica does, if they decide that to weapon weaponize against their own citizens. And that's precisely what's happening in a lot of countries, most notably in China, which we'll come to very, very soon. So, here's um, an example of what mathematicians call a graph on the left. The little nodes called vertices, they represent individuals. The edges between them represent some kind of connection. It could be in an arbitrary um, uh, form. It could be an interpersonal relationship or a business relationship or a workplace relationship. You can build these graphs for every type of relationship that you can conceivably imagine. Now, on the right is exactly the same graph as the one that's been written on the left. Um, all that we've done is moved around geometrically where those points are, but the connections between them is, is completely identical to the one written on the left. So those two graphs are completely identical. And what they've done is they've applied what's called a clustering algorithm to separate highly connected subcomponents of those graphs into very distinct regions. So if the, if the graph on the left represents all of society, everybody, and we know what these relationships between people are, you look at that graph and you think, hmm, that's a random mess. Now you apply a clustering algorithm to it, and you can immediately establish these different sub-communities between people, where there are closely connected type groups. In other words, if, we were, if that were, for example, a friendship uh, network on Facebook, you could establish, oh, this is a close group of friends. Or if that was a, um, a, a graph representing business relationships, this is a group of closely connected industries or this kind of thing. Arbitrarily, you can cluster things and infer what sort of groups people belong to. Now, the point is that one of our con concepts of how government should operate is that it shouldn't discriminate against us. But if things are automated based on machine learning, uh, it's impossible not to discriminate. Uh, it's all hidden in the statistics. It's all hidden in the connectivity within that network, what the different sub-communities are that you belong to. And it is impossible by any means to remove that from the way the system operates. So even if, for example, um, they pass laws saying that uh, uh, credit card companies are not allowed to discriminate on the basis of gender or race or or, uh, or gender identity, or anything at all. If they're using these sorts of machine learning techniques to identify credit risk, for example, it necessarily will discriminate. And it is impossible to remove that from the system because that's invisible to us. That's what's hidden in the underlying statistics and you can't remove that. It's a mathematical uh, necessity. So, along comes Peter Dutton. And, uh, of course, he wants us... Uh, to, to not have encryption and for the government to know everything that we do. And the, the argument that they always use every single time is terrorists, pedophiles, and drug dealers, okay? Okay, so um, realistically, uh, I kind of agree. Uh, yeah, uh, that's why everybody in government is using uh, encryption, because that, that's where all the criminals and terrorists are. Um, <laughs> But, of course, he's not referring to government to himself, he's referring to the rest of us. Um, here's a, a report that came out only in the last couple of months about the government's backdoor laws, uh, which, are, uh, which are, uh, are laws implemented by Dutton, enabling the government, with a, with, a, with, a, with a request, to go and demand backdoor access to people's uh, in, in, encrypted uh, information. And it was found that of all of the requests that were made, not a single one pertained to terrorism. They were all used for purposes which they were never advertised for. None of them were for ped pedophiles. None of them were for terrorists. It was all for other means altogether. When you hear politicians use these highly emotive words like terrorist, 
pedophile. The things that we relate to, the things that trigger very strong emotions, and people go, yes, need to stop that. But of course, that's just a, a Goebbels-like technique to, to try and manipulate your emotions to, to give away your freedoms for a completely ulterior motive that has nothing to do with terrorism whatsoever. So what's the, the other danger of having uh, backdoors inserted? Into our, into our encrypted messaging apps like WhatsApp and that kind of thing. If the government has the ability to go in and demand that they put in a backdoor access, well, what that means is that that one backdoor becomes compromised, then it compromises everybody, the whole system. So it's a, it, what engineers call a single point of failure. If they insert a backdoor into, a, into an app at, at the request of the government, with the presumption that the government only has the ability to access that back door. If that becomes compromised by someone else, then everything is compromised. So it's not just opening you up to making you vulnerable to the government, it's making you vulnerable to anyone who comes up with some clever way to, uh, to subvert that back door and, and get access to it by creating a single point of failure in the entire security apparatus. And no engineer would ever tell you that that's a smart thing to do. And it's exactly why uh, in, uh, a certain Cloud company is a good friend of mine, I won't name him, uh, but many of you will know him. He runs a very successful cloud computing company uh, based in Australia and the United States. Following uh, Dutton's introduction of these laws, he immediately moved his whole cloud operations offshore because the government's ability to demand this backdoor access completely compromises their entire business model. In other words, this isn't just about undermining people's security, it's undermining the economy because an essential component in any sort of cloud infrastructure is that you be able to trust the provider that you're working with. And if the government has the ability to go in and secretly demand backdoor access, it compromises the entire business model. And so this compromises our entire economy in the 21st century. So for a long time, governments have been trying to uh, prevent us from using encryption technology. Uh, for a long time, uh, many uh, cryptographic uh, codes, the algorithms behind them, were considered munitions. They were actually protected and, and uh, it was illegal to export them, to share the algorithms with overseas entities because they were considered a dual-use technology or, or a defense or munitions technology because they could be used to subvert government. So this is um, the entire source code in the C programming language for the AES-256 private key encryption algorithm, which I managed to squeeze onto one slide. Now, the point is that when things are so compact and so well known and so impossible to prevent from being shared, when the government says, we want a backdoor in your app, who are they really targeting it at? Because you can download that in five seconds by doing a Google search and compile it yourself. And any sophisticated terrorist or organized crime group would obviously do so. When they say we want a backdoor in the app, in other words, the one that you get from the app store that installs on your phone, by definition, they're not targeting the terrorists or the pedophiles or the well-organized crime groups because they've precisely got the intelligence to download the source code for themselves and compile it on their own computer where there's no possibility for a backdoor. Who they're actually targeting is the everyday person because they want to build up that network graph of your connectivity so that they have an understanding of how you fit into society and therefore compromise you and everybody around you. So one of my favorite things uh, that happened uh, in the United States, some of you might remember this, when the DVD uh, video format came out, it was region protected, right? You had to buy a DVD and you could only use it in a certain region. And the, the, the way that they implemented that was using a certain very, very simple cryptographic code. So simple that someone very, very quickly reverse engineered it. And then that was made illegal because uh, it was in violation of copyright laws. And then someone had the clever idea that, well, the algorithm is so compact that what we'll do is we'll print it on a T-shirt and then under the Second Amendment, it's considered freedom of speech. So this movement mass produced this, these t-shirts and everybody started walking around with the t-shirts with the DVD region uh, de decoding algorithm written upon it and they were considered constitutionally protected for that reason. I don't know how that works in other countries. My favorite one was this because um, 
The RSA encryption algorithm, which is the public key encryption algorithm that's used for, uh, it was originally considered also a, a, a ammunition. Uh, these days it's just used everywhere and everybody knows the algorithm. But, but back in the early days it was highly protected. It was, it was uh, a controlled technology that could not be exported. Um, there's the source code. It's so compact someone wrote it down in a little bit of Perl code, printed it onto a t-shirt and wrote, if you can't read it, warning this is classified as a munitions and may not be exported from the United States or shown to foreign nationals. But, uh, but people were able to walk through airports uh, wearing that t-shirt, which I thought was absolutely fantastic. The bottom line is that you can't stop the propagation of these actual algorithms. They're, they're so well known and they're so well studied and they're so readily available. It's, just, it's a piece of text, okay? You can't possibly control this. So, so what are they really getting at when they, when they, when they try to, to do this? Well, well uh, there was a recent incident in, uh, in Singapore where, as you know, fake news is a big problem these days. There's no denying it and there are many ways that <coughs> come around that, Singapore decided to use the authoritarian approach and they implemented a law where the government by decree can declare that something is fake news and that can result in a takedown notice of a, of a website or, or, or a government mandated um, a little uh, notice to be appended to web pages with a clarification on behalf of the government. It's been used in different ways. And they wanted to use this to combat fake news, you know, the, the anti-vaxxers and all of these dangerous people. Uh, do you think that's actually how it ended up being used? No. So what actually happened is the first notable use of it was that uh, a prominent uh, uh, anti-Singaporean government Facebook page run by a single dude uh, from, uh, from outside of Singapore, uh, they put a takedown notice on his Facebook page so Facebook was legally prevented from having that shown in the Singaporean jurisdiction uh, uh, because it was highly critical of the Singaporean government and it had uh, very little to do with fake news and it's been consistently manipulated in many other ways. So governments are still actively trying to engage in censorship and, uh, and many other things. Um, here are some, some rules of thumb. Uh, in relation to, uh, to the things I've just said. If you're using SMS or phone, just assume your own government knows everything. If you're using Gmail or Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp, assume US and Five Guys, Five Eyes knows everything. If you're using WeChat, assume the Chinese government knows everything. And if you choose Telegram, assume the Russian government knows everything. And if you use Facebook or Twitter, assume everybody knows everything. Um, so, who would we actually like to give our information to? Preferably nobody, or if we choose everybody, so I did a little experiment with WeChat, which is a platform I normally would never dare use because, because well, I mean, just like it's just ridiculous. But anyway, so I sent a, me a message to a, to a friend in China saying, last night when I was having sex with Xi Jinping, you wouldn't believe what he asked me to do to him. <laughs> and, then, and then I sat there periodically watching with my clock, wait, opening WeChat, keeping track of time, wondering how long it would take for them to come in within 24 hours, permanently blocked from the platform. <laughs> and then uh, a short time later on Facebook, same friend, I'm not impressed, Peter, I'm really not. Uh, so I don't know what, what happened to him, but uh, and anyway, that's one of the multitude of reasons why I can't go back to China ever again. So what did you ask you to do? Uh, yeah, well, it didn't actually happen. <laughs> Which brings me on to China. Um, which is the best contemporary example of the danger of all of the things that I've been talking about up until now, which is the combination of what you can do with inferring uh, clusters and, and associations between people and what you can do by intercepting their communications. And you've all heard of China's social credit system by now. It's become a very mainstream story. So this is an infographic that I downloaded from the internet showing all the things that feed into their data analysis. Now, to give you an idea of how sophisticated this is, in China, every CCTV camera across the country has a live stream going into their central computer, and it all uses facial recognition. So they track real-time every single citizen and their behavior. They know how many bottles of booze you buy at the bottle shop, and if you buy too many bottles of vodka, then that will negatively impact your social credit score, right? Um, now, if your social credit score goes below a certain amount, 
you are automatically restricted from using public transport. You can't fly anymore. You can't leave the country. You can't take out uh, a loan anymore. Okay, so this is a direct attempt to algorithmically manipulate society based on all of the exposures that I've previously mentioned. The interception, the association, the clustering algorithms, the statistical inference of who you are and what you believe and what the likelihood of you being a danger to the system is. That's what this is about. But it goes even further than that. With the Ready, Debt, Go app, which you can download currently, this is active on the Chinese App Store. That's an actual screenshot from that app. And what it does is it superimposes a map showing you everything within a 500 meter radius and pinpoints individuals within your proximity uh, who are in debt and have unfulfilled debt obligations. Now, here nobody would give a shit if you had an unpaid credit card, I wouldn't care. But of course, in a different culture where, where that's considered a very dishonorable thing, then that's a highly socially manipulative thing to do. Effectively, it's an attempt to make these people social outcasts. And that's how they'll be treated. So this is basically a real-time app that says, these are the bad people in society. You don't interact with these people. So now we can have a system for a police state which doesn't even involve the police. It becomes self-reinforcing. The police are no longer guys running around with a gun. They're guys who are writing algorithms on a computer to decide what sort of people are the good guys and what sort of people are the bad guys. Obviously, that number doesn't actually have to reflect debt in the future. What this app is is a social experiment to see whether it's possible to manipulate society just algorithmically, and then that will be fully automated streamlined into the social, social credit system that we spoke of. So this leads on to the bigger issue, to prevent ourselves going down that route, because none of this is hypothetical. This is already fully implemented. Those are actual screenshots of what's happening in the world's most populous nation, one-fifth of the world's population. How do we defend ourselves from going down that route, which clearly uh, our government, successive governments, in particular certain ministers, are actively pushing for. What are the real reasons they want to have access to your, to your association network and your metadata, which reveals information about who you're connected with? When they say, we don't want your messages, we just want your metadata, what do you read into that? They want to know who you're connected with. They want to build the graph to know what your associations are so that they can try and statistically discriminate you. How do we protect ourselves against this? Nathan and I had dinner the other night and coming up with some ideas for how we might define what rights really mean in the, in the digital era. And here are some of the suggestions that, are, that we came up with uh, that are, hopefully you'll all have some feedback on. And there are some people from security professions here who might have some even better ideas. The first one is that we should have a right in the digital era to private and anonymous communication. That is, all of these apps, by law, we should be allowed to use them in an uncompromised way. We should be free from government data retention. The government should not be allowed to store things like metadata and these social network graphs about us that allow them to discriminate against us in ways that go against everything that we believe is free in a modern society. We should have the right to use cryptocurrencies. This is a, obviously a very big one that every, every world government is trying to crack down on because they recognise what a threat cryptocurrencies pose to the central banking system. But this should also be a fundamental right in the modern era because it bypasses government and they recognise that as a threat against themselves. We should be free from censorship, which means they should not be allowed to use simplistic arguments like, oh, we're preventing fake news. Uh, to, to try and trick us into uh, giving away our freedom to see what we want to see. We should be free from observation, which means that the police should not be allowed to, to intercept any of that electronic or digital information unless there's some very, very well-founded reason for it, and they should not be allowed to interfere with it in any way. And importantly, going back to the earlier issue of uh, the defence munitions uh, laws regarding encryption technology, we should be free to do research because I'm a researcher. We should be free to engage in research in cryptography and share it with the world because the whole modern internet would have failed if it weren't for this in the past, if the governments of the past had have succeeded in preventing any of these encryption technologies from becoming available. The whole internet today would not function the way that it does. 
This last one, though, is a very, very challenging one for lots of you hardcore libertarians. On one hand, you believe that private enterprise has the right to do what they want on their platforms. On the other hand, we believe in the unquestionable right to freedom of speech. So how do you, how do you find the balance between those two things? Um, if it was a highly competitive market and all these different social media platforms, we could just freely and equally switch between them, fine, you choose the one you want, but we actually live in a world where it's completely monopolized. And when in terms of social media, it's basically Facebook and Twitter, and that's it. Okay, so if they come in and manipulate that, this, this, this duopoly, then they effectively have mass control over contemporary freedom of speech. That's effectively the same as a quasi form of government when they are that powerful and that centralized and they're known to, to work in conjunction with agencies like the National Security Agency. That's been well documented. So how do we find that right balance between the right of, of private enterprise to develop software platforms and the right for people to freely, freely express themselves on those platforms? I know that I've had instances where I've been temporarily blocked on social media platforms. I was not entitled to any explanation, for example. I know that the LDP had multiple State Division pages taken down on Facebook, I believe without explanation, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, should, for example, that be uh, considered a digital right, that if you do run a commercial platform for expression, that at least there be the requirement, for, for example, for transparency and the right to have an explanation when, when you are forbidden from saying things. That's a difficult one to balance up. All of the former ones, I believe, are sort of irrefutable in my mind in the modern era because if any of those things are compromised, then all of our original concepts of freedom, like freedom of speech and freedom from government intervention, don't make any sense in the digital era whatsoever. So, to address this, what steps can people take? Well, first of all, the last thing you do is, tr is trust uh, commercial companies that say, we have a commercial product and we guarantee your safety. You don't trust people. What you actually trust is openness. You trust open source technology. Why? So because if the source code for, uh, for a piece of software is openly available, it means that there's an entire world community of people that are very, very devoted to this kind of cause, very closely inspecting the code to make sure that it's not compromised and that it hasn't got backdoors. It means that any attempt to insert a backdoor by the government can very easily be detected. You could even download the source code yourself and compile it yourself just to be sure, verify that it matches. But the, but the important point is that you're not relying on the trust of any individual or government or company, whether it be Apple or Google, with what, whatever promises they make. You're relying in the collective ability of a large group of developers to recognize when something is wrong. And that's, that's a far better trust mechanism than any other that you can conceivably imagine and say the cost from a commercial company like Facebook, which subsequently gets compromised by Cambridge Analytica. So the, some of the experts in the audience might have some input on, on this, but here, here are some of my original recommendations for, as, a, as a default for, um, for, for messaging and voice and video calls and group chats. Use the Signal app, which is an open source and very well studied uh, um, uh, app that you can get across every platform on your phone, your desktop, everything. Um, Keybase is a really good alternative to a Slack-like system for those of you who do uh, uh, group, uh, group work on Slack. It's been compromised in the past multiple times and they didn't actually fully disclose that. So it's very open to industrial espionage. Keybase has an encrypted file system underneath it, uh, allowing all of those facilities. Uh, you can encrypt your, your mail using uh, PGP, which is based on these sorts of algorithms that I've discussed before, but it is a bit complicated and technical to use for the end user, so a good um, free and open source and, and verifiable alternative is ProtonMail, which actually implements the same uh, t uh, crypto protocols underneath, but makes it easy for the end user. And very importantly, uh, use VPNs to try and shield your location so the government doesn't know where you are. Whatever you do, don't trust browsers like, like the Google Chrome browser, for example, because that feeds directly into their database of what your browsing history is. You want to use private browsing modes on, on uh, open source browsers like Firefox, or if you're really, really paranoid, you can use uh, the Tor browser, which I actually have never used, but, um, but other people might have uh, input on that one. I didn't know that VPN providers are trustworthy. 
Sorry? How do you know the VPN provider is trustworthy? Yeah, um, that is a question that I would probably defer to someone like Stu at the back. Maybe we can come back to that at the end of the talk. Yeah. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, in conclusion, uh, don't let Dutton turn Australia into the People's Republic of China because that's our collective responsibility to do so. And so that's my case for what we call crypto anarchy. I'm not, I don't identify as an anarchist in the real world, but in the digital world, I believe that we have irrefutable rights to pursue these technologies and to use them at will, because at the end of the day, the justifications for not doing so are never used for what they said they are, which is terrorists and pedophiles. It's there targeted at the masses so that ultimately it can be used against you, which is already affecting one-fifth of the world population. It's not a hypothetical scenario at all. How fitting that he got the Chinese flu? Sorry? How oh. fitting that he got the Chinese flu, Peter Dutton? <laughs> After you probably already prepared that. <laughs> I didn't orchestrate that. <laughs> so um, uh, maybe uh, open it up to some discussion at that point. Um, maybe uh, Stu or Eleanor. You want to answer? Uh, to, um, to the VPN question? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, it depends, is the, is the answer. I mean, it depends what you're trying to protect against, right? So, if your objective here is uh, to avoid being assumed on by your own government, then simply getting a VPN that, that lands you in a different jurisdiction means you've at least got two barriers, right? So, a government wants to find out, the Australian government wants to find out something about you, you're landing, say, in Switzerland or some other highly jurisdictional, you know, protective location. At a bare minimum, the government authority is going to have to ask and sort out a warrant in that direction. Um, there's a few others uh, solutions to this. The, one way is that you don't technically have to go and pay for a VPN provider to do a VPN, right? You can go to one of a multitude of hosting companies, go and get a virtual machine that you have access to, and as long as you're routing traffic over that, you've achieved the goal. Um, the key with yeah, this gets complicated. The key with the key with um, privacy ultimately is how many chains or how many uh, hops is there between the party that's trying to identify who you are, right, and yourself. And how easy is it for you to break one or two of those chains, preferably two, right? The more barriers you put in place, the less likely it is that someone's going to be able to trace one to the next to the next to the next. Now, I mean. Tor was specifically set up to counter this, this, this risk, right? You know, VPN's very point to point. Um, Tor, by definition, uh, works on, a, on an algorithm which is random selection inside a pool. Um, the important thing to note, though, is don't VPN then Tor, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's the thing to note here, because you may not be able to, the thing is about VPN traffic is you may not be able to decrypt what's in the traffic, you can run heuristics on it, like quite effectively. You know what the packet size is, you know what the rough uh, data set is, right? And so therefore it's quite easy to take a huge pool of data and then isolate it down to just the VPN streams. And once you've done that, you've, you've, you've decreased something from petabytes down to gigabytes, right? And then I can start figuring out you know, who are these individuals. So you're saying basically you've reformatted it into a way that makes it easier to reveal information about Yeah, them. well, yeah, funnel it, funnel, you know, yeah. you're funneling down because it is quite <laughs> easy to identify if set traffic or VPN mm. traffic. Yeah. Um, but like I said, it really depends who you're trying to protect against, right? Um, just by moving jurisdictions or moving to jurisdictions that you know have really high privacy protection, which you can quite easily determine it's logged into a VPN provider, right? Um, then you know you, you're instantly out of your barrier there. Probably the other thing I would say is just because you're on VPN doesn't mean you can stop using TLS like patient yes. I'm just reminded of the Swiss encryption company that Iran used to buy their equipment from and it turned out it was a CIA front. Yeah, well for, for yeah. a decade and a half. So that's yeah. why you're a nuclear um facilities and are the information Yeah, I mean look I <laughs> I picked on Switzerland in particular um, because, ironically, Switzerland does not have the greatest internet protections out there. Um, Norway does, so it's Finland, right? Um, for what it's worth, um, uh, Finland, I believe, it's actually in their legal constitution. So, um, you know, there is a there's, a there's a few edge cases there, but but I mean, yeah, I don't know if I've given an answer to that, Pete. But no, no, that's that's great. Thanks. <laughs>
Es fa per donar que tothom. Aquí. Yeah. Yeah, I'm probably being a bit of a pedant, but in terms of the, the list of rights you listed, um, the, the first one was the, the right to private communication. And I, I sort of get where you're going with it, but from a, you know, a, what, what people would call an autistic libertarian perspective, that sounds like a positive right, like a right to healthcare. So if someone doesn't want to provide you with private communication, can you enslave them and force them to, or you're just talking oh, about... No, no. <laughs> you're just talking about... <laughs> So let me rephrase yeah. it. I'm, I'm saying the government doesn't have the right to force us not to. Yes, yes. Okay, but so if I rephrased yeah. it like that, would you be happier? I'm much happier. Yeah, yeah, okay, yes, fine. Yeah. I think we're on the same wavelength. Yes, yeah, so I sort of got where you were coming from. You, you, just, you, 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 you have yeah. the liberty to use SMS if you want to. Yes, <laughs> yes. No, but uh, the sort of the other way. Like if, if, um, if there was no private communication that existed, mm. right? So sort of if you... And I'm sort of coming at it this angle because if you actually put that in a constitution in, in that language mm. or if you, you, or in an act or something like that, if there was no private communication available, then someone could argue that the government was obliged to provide it because uh, sure. you have a right to it. Yeah, so it would be better to rephrase it in the, in the context of the government doesn't have the right to deprive us of it. Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. So I sort of get where you're yeah. coming from. Yeah. I just the, 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 yeah. the, Sort of the phraseology of it. Sort of. uh, sure, uh, but you could argue the same thing that freedom of speech doesn't mean that I have to talk, right? Um, um, no, no, but it, well, you, you don't have the... Uh, again, it, it's phrased in a way, freedom of speech, that, mm -hmm. that means you have the freedom to speak. Yeah. Um, no one has to actually provide you with a platform to speak. No, that's correct. Right. Right. But with the private, uh, with the right to private communication, someone actually does have to provide you with that platform. Mm -hmm. So if you phrase it in that way, mm -hmm. I think it, it, it can sort of lead to a, a sort of um, like a, a lefty sort of positive rights thing. If in theory, if someone decided to not provide you with it, mm -hmm. uh, I, I agree. Think, I uh, re rephrasing those rights in terms of the government doesn't have the right to deprive us of these. Things. Yes, yes. I think only uh, the uh, first uh, one uh, was uh, actually a problem from the way I was looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. A very sort of um, pedantry thing, but I, I thought I'd ask anyway. <laughs> so um, the reality is, you know, terrorists and drug dealers and pedophiles are going to use these, mm. like these certain um, apps and messaging platforms. What's a good way to balance, you know? But, but you see, the, 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 the way I see it, if, if you're, um, if you're ISIS, okay, um, and you know that uh, that an app has been compromised by the government by law, you will do what I. Uh, showed on that screen, you would take a photo with your smartphone of that screenshot, compile that code for yourself and use it and there's no possibility of the government getting in there. Okay. The point is that, as I said, the, these, these backdoors aren't directed at those people. They're smart enough. Yeah. Um, and now mind you, uh, Jared Kushner of course uses WhatsApp to communicate with, with Mohammed bin Salman when greenlighting the dismemberment of Washington Post journalists in embassies. Um, well, so if we work off the assumption that the average member of ISIS is smarter than Jared Kushner and uses Signal instead of WhatsApp, which they probably are, um, uh, then, um, uh, uh, you know, there's, the, there's no stopping it. The yeah. really orchestrated, hardcore, organized guys so you are, are ones that you're not going to stop because yeah. these are all openly known protocols. Yeah. What they're really targeting is, the is, 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 the, is, yeah. is the average citizen so that they can mass collect. Yeah. and use that against you. And that's what it's being used for in China. Yeah, that's right. David? So, uh, this, this issue has been around a while, and I've been wondering for a long time what's the best way to tackle it. I mean, what you've taken there is a pretty principled approach, the you know, rights-based approach. I, I can't see envisage any situation in which we're going to get any progress on that. See no sign of that at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. So that then raises the question of where, where can progress be made? You mean for, from a politically pragmatic perspective? From a pragmatic perspective, yeah. yeah. So one of the issues that I'm always uncomfortable about is when the lefties start whinging about companies using data. Well, I, I can't see anything profoundly wrong if I order a shirt on, on the internet um, ads for underpants or socks or mm. something else turning up in my in my Twitter feed sure. or Facebook. Sure, I think target actually. advertising has a huge positive advantage. Exactly. I don't yeah. give a rat's ass about yeah. that. So, and yet the lefties get all animated about it. Because, mm. you know, big corporations are bad. Um, 
big governments that they control are good, you know, that's that <laughs> logic. So I'm, I've been wondering for quite a while now whether um, we, we sacrifice uh, the companies in order, on, on a general principle basis, in order to keep the government out. There's precedent for that with the privacy laws. The, the initial privacy laws were aimed at the government, not, not any other uh, participants in society. They've now been extended a bit more, a bit more broadly. But still, the most strict privacy laws are directed at state and federal governments. So, um, if there was restrictions on, you know, Maya or Amazon or, or whatever, selling online, using your buying and habits to uh, sell you other stuff, and but as as the price of that, uh, and that when you went with that as the price for well, the government can't do anything like that to you either. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've often wondered whether that's a reasonable, pragmatic approach. Well, I see. I see targeted advertising as highly economically beneficial. Yes, I in the sense that it enormously improves economic efficiency. I, I see that as one of the positive benefits of data harvesting. But the negative benefit is should it be manipulated for political purposes against its own citizens, which is what Cambridge Analytica did, and if a small office is capable of doing that, then the full orchestration of the National Security Agency or any other equivalent uh, intelligence agency in any country, the ability to manipulate their own citizens in these China-like ways is obviously the negative example of that. So I agree, there, there are positive and negative uses, but the negative uses are overwhelmingly uh, in the government domain, I believe. Can I just flag though that, that putting aside the large corporations, if I as an independent software developer want to go build a piece of software that uses a lot of encryption technology in it, right, um, for peer-to-peer -peer communication, which means there is no central server, right now an Australian government representative can approach me and demand, not ask, but demand under threat of jail, yeah. right, that, that I make sure that, that they have access to it and that I release a piece of software right, with those controls now. And it's illegal for you to make it um, no. Well, I mean, that, that then raises the question, am I legally allowed to write it? Right? I mean, I could, but, but am I legally allowed to? And, I mean, the only time that there's going to be an opportunity, the only time that you would see a legal challenge to one of those requests is not an independent software developer, it's a Facebook or a, or a WhatsApp or, a, you know, they're the only ones that have the resources to fight. Did that let pass? Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. Right, so I mean, the, the challenge is right that, I mean, Pete talked about open source. An open source developer, he doesn't get paid anything, right? So, so he doesn't get paid anything. You're not an employee. You're not an employee, you have no protections. Right? If, as an individual, you have no protections at all. And without going into any details, I mean, this stuff does actually happen, right? The guys rock up in briefcases, their name is always John. <laughs> Dead serious. The name is always John. You always ring a random number, and their answer is always John, right? And they don't disclose who they are, other than the fact that they're a representative from the Attorney General's Department. That's it, right? And I mean, what do you do? I mean, you're a software developer, right? You're not going to stand up to a bunch of guys in suits telling you they can go to jail, right? <laughs> don't, they, just... don't they have to get a warrant? Well, it, it depends. It, well, no, so, so, so I believe the backdoor laws are at the discretion of the minister, it's not yeah. court ordered, correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. And or, and, I mean, but th there's, there's various, look, uh, yeah. People without a warrant, they comply with all the social I wouldn't, yeah. well, I wouldn't say they don't have a warrant, I would say that the warrant that they may have can be very, very broad. Mm -hmm. Just, just people who don't know anything about them. Yeah, first what you and David were saying, just the name Duncan Limp. Than anything to anybody in this room. Yeah. 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 A few. Okay. Duncan Lamp was doing exactly what you described in America. He was developing an encrypted peer to peer communications app so three percenters and concerned individuals could communicate without the alphabet boys listening to them. Two nights ago, they served a no knock warrant on his house while he was asleep, kicked his door in, shot him in the head. Then they stepped on his neck to make sure he was dead. 
And they shot his wife. They shot her as well, did they? Just for good measure. Yeah. Um, I'm not surprised. Yeah. And those cops would have absolutely believed that he was a threat to national security and they were doing their job because the warrants and the documents are worded in such a way that they're not going to say, no, that's an illegal order. I'm not going to follow it. That, that just happened. There's protests being organised, you know, justice for Duncan Lim, placards. So it's not just Australian guys. Did you say that was in the United States? States? Yeah. It's just a few days ago. Two days ago. Yeah, right. I saw the sort of the background in another context. Yeah. yeah, he was doing the right thing, and they shot him. Just. I had a, I had a not not as dark as that, but I had a strange experience recently where I got a thirty day ban on Facebook, and it was. What's strange about that? <laughs> <laughs> but strange. That wasn't sixty days. Well, I've been well years ago. They actually they banned me, and they said I had to provide them with a copy of my driver's license. To be on Facebook, so they don't even have a copy of my driver's license. That's my ticket on Facebook. Yeah, they, they, someone reported him as a fake profile. That happens all the time. That you actually have to provide identification and say you're a real person. But, oh. but, the, but the more recent one was I made a positive, a slight, only slightly positive remark about somebody who is considered a hate figure to Facebook, and they said uh, they banned me, and I said I didn't know why I was banned, so I appealed, and within 90 seconds the appeal had been reviewed, and they came back and said I was still banned. And I had to track down a whole stack of other information to figure out why I was banned. And it turns out this particular figure, and there are a list of people, if you make positive remarks about them on Facebook, you will get a ban. If you make negative remarks about them, that's all good. So it's actually like a distributed defamation attack on certain people because anyone that wants to say something bad about them has free reign to do so. And anyone who wants to defend them or say anything positive about them is cut down and silenced. Sure. I think it's rather hideous. I reckon I'm on that list. But, but the, the ability, the, the ability to post select what what, what, what gets through is just as just powerful as the ability to dictate what people say. We got rid of that problem, don't worry about it. I'll test that. I'll say something nice about you. Get bad to say David Lionel's alright. All sued. Sharon, any other questions? So, so practical terms, I mean, I, I'm all, all for um, negative rights, um, but we've had this, you know, circular argument forever about mm. even such fundamentals as free speech and mm. freedom of religion and freedom sure. of association and so forth. As soon as you start talking about that, the lefties are saying, oh, but, but we've got to have a right to welfare or to education or to health or, you know, um, um, freedom from um, uh, infectious diseases, or God knows what. So, so um, <laughs> how do you? And, and, I mean, but the, the best rights are always the government shall not. Mm. Um, I don't think you need to convince this group mm. um, of that. Mm -hmm. the, the issue, I suppose, is uh, we haven't even got the basics in this country. Um, at that level, we've got this merely mouthed political free speech, mm. and that's about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but I, I agree uh, that um, it is better to, to frame it as a, a negative right for the state than a positive right for the individual, because it avoids the opening of the can of worms to every other right right we should have. Oh, oh, yeah, you can't do it the other way. It's just not practical. Gareth. Um, I suppose, like you, with all the stuff with Julian Assange and all that sort of coming um, up, what are your thoughts on, on all that? Um, See, <laughs> that whole story, I just, I, this, there are just too many unknown unknowns to be able to say anything meaningful. I mean, uh, lots of people have views on it. Um, yeah, but. Um, just, just the thoughts with I know that certainly Edward Snowden uh, uh, is one of the key advocates of the Signal app in particular. Uh, in fact, he features on their, on their homepage if you go to signal.org. Uh, Edward Snowden is the first face that comes up uh, saying that he strongly endorses that app. Um, no, I mean, individual cases, are, it's very hard to comment on because by virtue of what we're talking about, there's so much that we don't know. So I can't possibly know, but what I do defend is people's ability to be able to do those sorts of things. Well, it's not like a government defence, to be honest. Like an Australian citizen, 
No, that's right. That's right. Right. I mean, forget and about whether or not he's legally done anything wrong, but he's just been fucked over by Australia doing fuck all. Right? Like, sure. Park whether or not he's guilty or not. Yeah, the, the, the argument as to whether the Australian government is doing its part to defend a citizen's uh, rights is, 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 is pretty clear cut. Um, whether he was correct in leaking various things, that's a, that's a different question. But, yeah. So who's spying on Wicca me? Oh, yeah, sorry, you've, you've heard of spying on, on Wicca. The... No, you said your answer is who's spying on all of the apps? Yeah, oh. I mean, you left Signal off, but um, I use that too. But, but... What about Wicker? I used to communicate with Malcolm Turnbull on Wicker. Yeah, I, I, I used to use Wicker as well a long time ago. I haven't used it for a long time. I don't even keep up to date with it. Uh, does well, it's it? California, right? So, is it? Yeah, so it's like, fine, like it's so, so, well, you have to make sure. You, I mean, look, the, the bottom line is that anything that comes out of Silicon Valley, you have absolutely no guarantee that the US government isn't watching. Mm. That's that's like that. Like, if you just want to be really clear cut about it. Because even if they weren't watching now, you could get a over the wire update overnight, mm. right? An auto update that puts it back to. And on. there you go. Yeah. Right? And I mean that might that might only be enabled for non-US citizens because that mm. way we're not breaking any amendment rights or anything like that, mm. right? But I mean that is a trivial update to do. Yeah. So, yeah. literally anything out of California, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you were going to do a catch all. That would be it. Which pretty much is everything. <laughs> I'm trying to be too hyperbolic about it. <laughs> that would certainly so, cover your conversation with Malcolm Turnbull anyway. Neither of you are US citizens, so that would be. That's right. Just change I mean, is there an element where basically Australians don't have any. They don't have. A, I mean, forget about the encryption part, but it's just, there's no. There's no right to privacy, there's no right to free speech, basically. Those, those two, you know, if you just start off with that, then even if something did go wrong, mm -hmm. you might have a backup plan. That's right. We still don't have a positive right to freedom of speech. Ah. So, so, yes, it is hard to enforce this. But that's, that, that's maybe why I like the term crypto anarchy, as in we take, we take this into our own hands and we just do this, right, and, and screw them. If they tell us we're not allowed to, then fuck them. We just, we, we'll make this technology. Whether they like it or not. Well, the not. thing is, that's going to happen. Yeah, precisely. And that's exactly what's happened. Yeah. Well, no, but that's just it. That's going to happen. It's going to happen. Right? And it's just whether or not it happens in circles that mean the rest of society gets to use it, mm. or if it happens in circles like the three areas that Pete pointed out. Right? Yeah. Like, like, organized crime is funded enough that they could fund this. I mean, yeah, you're not talking, like, you're probably only talking maybe a couple million dollars in dev. Honestly, mm -hmm. like, this is not a particularly difficult... When you market. keep in mind that the cocaine market is a trillion dollar industry, yeah, I mean, no, like, they, they can not, afford this stuff, it's right? It's not hard, <laughs> just tobacco importing, I mean, enough to develop well, yeah. a million <laughs> That's right. But I, I think you're right, it's just going to happen anyway. So I, I look at... Uh, um, Alternatives to Twitter, for example, which I um, well, there's Mastodon, which is the, one of the main um, well, then, open But then, I mean, Gab was is tries to present themselves as an alternative to Twitter, but uh, all of the alternative sort of, all the ways to monetize it have been shut down. They can't. The only way you can pay them is Bitcoin. That's right. There's no other method you can. Pay but, but but the other big problem with um, any type of alternative social media system is that it's not going to work unless it has a critical mass yeah. and people aren't going to start using it if there isn't a critical mass exactly. so by definition it doesn't pick up like um, there was one that I started using a while back called minds.com and the design of the platform was fantastic I really really liked it I thought it was incredibly cleverly thought through but just useless because nobody uses it and nobody's going to use it unless everybody else is using it so it's going to remain monopolistic by definition um, I personally don't know much about it, but I haven't heard, heard, haven't heard it mentioned this evening. Um, blockchain? Mm -hmm. Any comments? Oh, um, yeah, well, I mean, that that's sort of at the heart of, um, of cryptocurrencies, uh, definitely. Um, so when I, I made the, the, the statement about the right to use cryptocurrencies, that's the underlying that's technology there is blockchain. But of course, blockchain has far broader applications than just 
digital currencies that's being used for all manner of things. It's really just um, a way of uh, making a, a, a cryptographically enforced record of, uh, of a set of statements or transactions or, or contracts or whatever the case may be. That's incredibly important, um, but, but, but really um, the one that the part of, of blockchain that really compromises or threatens government is the fact that it enables currencies that bypass national currencies. If it weren't for that, I think governments would be uh, really quite positive about blockchain technologies because it has so many positive benefits. The one thing about it that threatens them is that it threatens their national currencies via things like Bitcoin and the various other cryptocurrencies. That's the reason they're paranoid about it. Certainly, um, blockchain is heavily used in industry for various, all manner of non-financial things already. The ASX is there's a system being built in Sydney by Digital Asset, which is a tender as a replacement for the chess system, mm. which uses blockchain technology. Mm -hmm. Not like Bitcoin, it's not intended to be anonymous. Yeah. Um, it's intended to have some sort of record of transactions. But the by the way, um, ironically, you might know uh, the Chinese government is making their own uh, national blockchain based um, cryptocurrency, which will be a nationally endorsed one. But obviously that's going to be specifically designed to have certain features so that they have full audit trails rather than being anonymous the way regular yes. cryptocurrencies are. This will all be fully locked down into their hardcore protocols and will probably feed into their social credit system and everything. So, so what you're saying is that the Chinese are highly regulating something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, surprisingly, right? But the, the point is they recognize the benefit of having a blockchain-based economy. Um, that's mainly for the non-repudiation Mm, yeah, precisely. So it's right? like blockchain doesn't equal anonymity, and in fact, mm. Bitcoin doesn't equal anonymity. No, it doesn't. Right, There's so other so cryptos that do. So, yeah. so, I mean, like, a cryptocurrency has to specifically choose to add anonymity functions. Um, the blockchain part's just there to ensure that there's not a, a centralized element yeah. to it, right? So it's the distributed element, mm. um, which can only do with non repudiations. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, we might leave it there. Great, thank you. Thank you very much.